Thank you, Andre, um, for the invitation to give this talk. Um, please uh, do interrupt me at any time if you have questions. Um, this talk is uh, really like, um, uh, has the flavor of a machine learning talk, but I'm trying, gonna try to like connect to things that physicists know and would be interested in um, kind of throughout. Um, so please do interrupt me if anything's un unclear. Um, so the outline uh, for the talk is, I want to first give a little bit of background on just deep learning, whatever is sufficient for sort of understanding this talk. And then uh, focus kind of have two parts on um, uh, very broadly talking about some of the research that I've done over the past two to three years with collaborators at Google, um, kind of trying to understand deep neural networks uh, very systematically. So uh, the first part will kind of be an overview of um, investigations into deep neural networks that are very wide or infinitely wide. And I'll talk about what width is and, and, and what a deep neural network even is um, in a minute. Uh, and then, um, you know, that, that was a very um, kind of fruitful direction that uh, I would say has been the focus of most of um, the theory in machine learning in recent years when focused on deep learning. So um, it, you know, the, the connections that uh, we were able to build there, us and, and others in the community uh, uh, were very fruitful. And uh, the second part will be about more recent work where we're trying to get away from these limits that we now feel we understand. Um, so particularly deep neural networks that are now have finite width. So backing off of an infinite width limit, but then also changing other aspects of the problem that very much drives it away from kind of a perturbative approach uh, to the study of like number one. So number two and number one, uh, the regimes of study are, are gonna turn out to be rather non-perturbatively related. Um, and I'll give you kind of a flavor of what, what we found in, in, that, um, in this new regime, uh, which we uh, call like the large learning rate phase of gradient descent in deep, in deep learning. Um, you'll see empirically that uh, systems that operate in this regime have uh, fairly universal empirical signatures. And then we're gonna try to understand um, these systems through simple models that have solvable dynamics. And it'll also reveal that there's a phase transition between two classes uh, of systems uh, in this regime, uh, which was not previously known. And I think that's um, a pretty exciting, um, pretty, pretty, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the implications of that um, and investigating that further. Um, so what is the problem that we're trying to solve um, here, which I've just cast as the learning problem. So there are many broad characterizations of uh, what learning is. Um, there are these terms you might have heard of supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. Um, so broadly speaking, supervised learning has to do with um, uh, trying to make predictions uh, given some inputs for some outputs and the data that you're provided uh, consists of both inputs and target outputs. Um, unsupervised learning uh, just means that you don't have this target supervision. You're not provided uh, outputs for the problem. You might just want to kind of find some structure in the data, whatever, whatever that means, um, uh, kind of geometrically by clustering or uh, just learning a full kind of joint. Another way of casting it is to say that you wanna learn a full joint probability distribution over a number of variables. Let's say the full distribution that describes um, images as opposed to say some kind of conditional distribution which is more what you deal with in supervised learning where I give you say an image and you want to kind of um, understand the conditional distribution of the label uh, given, given the image. Um, so the focus of this talk is going to be just supervised learning. It's the most vanilla setup. Um, and the setup is you're given a data set D, which consists of M um, training points. They're uh, pairs of X's and Y's uh, that can be high dimensional that are drawn from some distribution that you don't know. Distribution on the inputs and the outputs, X and Y. And the goal is from this finite size data set, you want to be able to predict Y for all the other points uh, you don't observe. Um, you're just trying to model the, the actual uh, distribution. And oftentimes what you'll do is if you take a parametric approach to the problem, you'll uh, you know, postulate some sort of good ansatz for the problem. So let's say you have some function f 
um, f of x, which is governed by some parameters theta, and then you try to learn what the thetas should be, kind of best fit parameters uh, for this problem so that you can learn um, the functional relationship between x and y. Um, so this is, this is the problem that we're going to uh, just be focused on, um, supervised learning. Now, there are um, uh, maybe two large, two kind of broadly distinct uh, approaches to this problem, uh, which you might be familiar with. One is to take a Bayesian approach. Uh, it's to do Bayesian inference. So in this case, what you do when you try to make a prediction is, um, you know, rather than uh, you, you try to uh, update kind of your knowledge about the system in a way that's consistent with Bayes' uh, rule. So going back to this model that you've, this onsets that you have f sub theta of x, you might start with some prior distribution on the parameters theta that you believe is kind of appropriate for this class of problems that you're dealing with. And then you're going to try to update this prior distribution over the variables, uh, over the parameters theta, to some posterior distribution, uh, which takes into account the fact that you have these m, you know, finitely many training points. So now you've you kind of update your knowledge of the parameters given this finite size data set, and uh, uh, you can use this update from the prior to the posterior to then make a prediction for any new point that you uh, that you observe. So let's say now you want to make a prediction for some new input x star and you want to know what is the distribution over the possible outputs of the model, which I'm calling f star, then um, you can condition on theta uh, and break up this kind of estimation problem uh, by conditioning on theta and integrating over theta. And so you see that the posterior here makes an appearance um, or rewriting this a different way, uh, just again using Bayes' rule, um, you, you have a likelihood times times a prior. And so um, Bayesian inference really, you can think of it as making predictions in a way that's consistent with Bayes' rule. And because of that, it will involve some integration over some, over these, uh, over a distribution of parameters rather than selecting one specific choice of parameters and making, um, making an estimate using that. Um, the second approach is what I'll refer to as empirical risk minimization. Uh, it has a relationship to Bayesian inference, which I'll mention in a moment. But here, uh, you kind of um, uh, you you take your m training points that you had, um, and then you kind of uh, apply. You you assume that there's some uh, kind of loss function or cost function that would be good for your problem, and um, this. Uh, the goal here is now to just minimize the loss. So the degree of agreement between the model predictions, uh, f sub theta on x, and the outputs, the, the labels that you were actually given, y. So for instance, this could be just a, a squared loss. That'll be a loss that actually I'll use through most of the talk. So just if you take the difference f sub theta minus y squared, that's a proper loss. And um, this is an empirical loss or empirical risk because you only have access to it on your M uh, training points. Um, I see. Oh, and by the way, I don't, I won't see uh, chat messages. So please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, so uh, this is the, the, the risk function. It's evaluated on the training set. That's why it's empirical. And we'd like to minimize it over theta. Um, but in this case, uh, really, you have to take into account the fact that what you really want to do is to be able to make good predictions uh, on any sample that's drawn from the distribution, not just your M training points. So really, although this is the thing that you try to optimize or minimize uh, when you do this procedure, the thing that you really care about is this other, um, this other quantity, the expectation, if you were to have infinitely many samples, say drawn from the distribution, uh, how good would that uh, loss or cost or risk be? You want that thing to be low. And so this is what uh, I'll refer to as, or is referred to as the population loss or population risk. This is the empirical one. You minimize this one, but you would, of course, at the end of the day, like to have a good predictor that works for that, uh, for any sample drawn from that distribution. 
And the relationship between these two, there, there can be a relationship, for instance, if you try to do, when you do maximum likelihood estimation or maximum uh, a posteriori estimation, what you do is uh, kind of uh, maximize either the likelihood or the, or the posterior. And so you're essentially taking a single sample from this theta integral um, uh, to do this rather than doing an integration over theta. So empirical risk minimization is what most of this talk will focus on, but I'll uh, mention a few things about uh, Bayesian inference um, later in the talk. And so, um, uh, so that's the that's the setup. That's like the algorithmic setup for what we want to do. Uh, but now, how do you choose your parametric model? So the new ingredient here in deep learning is that we're using a, a newer, richer class of models. Um, and I'll, I'll focus on just the simplest one. There have actually been a lot of strides made in more interesting architectures that has really pushed the boundary of what people can do. Um, but even in, even in this simple case of vanilla feed forward, fully connected network, um, uh, there's a lot of, there are theoretical uh, open questions that are not well understood. So what is this model? Um, you're gonna take an input X, which lies in some, uh, uh, d-dimensional um, space. Um, each of the layers in this, uh, in this network um, has parameters that are weights and biases. So a weight matrix, uh, WL, and a bias, BL. And so what you do is you apply, um, you can read it here also, uh, a sequence of um, kind of affine transformations followed by pointwise nonlinearities. So um, this is kind of the first, I'll refer to these Fs as pre-activations, they're signals, uh, they're, the, they're the function values that go into um, a nonlinear layer. And um, uh, you take the pre-activation from a previous layer, you apply a nonlinearity to it pointwise, and then you again apply another affine transformation. And uh, these sums over i's and j's are the sums over these hidden nodes in the network. Um, just to clarify here, so all, these all to all connections here kind of represent the weight matrices from one layer to the next that connects one layer to the next. And then at these nodes, you apply these nonlinearities phi, nonlinearity of your choosing until you get some other high potentially high dimensional output uh, at the end of the network, which will be f, uh, f, sub L, f to the L. Uh, and again, these i's index the hidden nodes of the network. Um, so for simplicity, let me uh, assume that we have an architecture where we have some uh, input and output dimensionality of fixed size, whatever that is, uh, for instance, d here. Um, but all the hidden layers uh, just for simplicity, have the same number of hidden units, let's say n. And when I talk about width or very wide networks, I'm going to be taking n to be large uh, and effectively infinite um, when I take the infinite width limit. Can I ask a quick question? This is Yan Zhong from Applied Math. Yes. Uh, in your previous slide, you formulate a minimization problem. I'm wondering, are you assuming that the existence uh, of a minimizer or not? No, no assumption at the moment. Um, how many minima there are uh, will depend on the problem, will depend really, uh, it could be anything. This is just, you know, what you might choose to do. If you would hope that there is, if you've done this well, that there is a minimum and that the minimum that you would find, uh, if, if you chose like a good, you know, F and you chose a good optimization procedure would be something that would do well would give you a good result when you plug it in down here. But minimizer but may not exist, right? Say that again? The minimizer may not exist. Yeah, it may not exist. There may be many of them. Um, in fact, you know, uh, in deep learning, uh, kind of one of the early issues people thought was going to be, turns out it's it's not really true in this in these limits as you'll see but um, the issue of like how many global minima local minima you have saddle points and all of that uh, there there could be many and people have studied um, this sort of question a lot um, so I think in general there are no guarantees necessarily depending on how you choose this F uh, and how you choose your optimization algorithm Okay, thank you so much. Whether you would even reach the ones that exist, that is to say. Yeah. 
Thank you for the question, by the way. Um, so, uh, so to come back to this, so this is the structure of the simplest vanilla uh, deep neural network that we're going to deal with, um, where each of the layers has n hidden nodes. And these Fs, again, I, I will refer to as preactivations. So deep learning in practice, what, are, what do we actually do nowadays? Um, even though you know, we have the option of doing many other things, for instance, Bayesian, Bayesian approaches. Um, uh, oftentimes what people are doing, uh, kind of the, the quick and dirty way is just to form this empirical risk uh, and then try to minimize over theta. So in practice, use a neural network to do the fun function approximation f sub theta. How should you choose the architecture? Um, that's kind of unclear. I guess th there aren't um, very um, strict design, uh, uh, design recommendations there. Um, people have a sense largely for like which sorts of architectures are doing well on which sorts of problems, for instance, in vision problems, uh, convolutional networks that might have um, certain choices for the depth and the width and the size of the filters and so on. But you choose, a you, you choose some neural network to do your function approximation. Uh, you form this empirical risk, this cost function, um, and then uh, you'll pick an algorithm for the optimization, oftentimes the most simplest one, which is just gradient descent, um, will, work, uh, will work pretty well. And then you'll optimize the parameters. Um, and then on top of that, there might be other hyperparameters that you might also need to tune. So for instance, it's not necessarily clear how you might choose the learning rate when you do the optimization. Um, in principle, like the distinction, there's, there are these terms that get used, so parameters versus hyperparameters, um, and the distinction between them isn't um, necessarily super clear all the time, but largely, loosely, I would say most of the time parameters are the things that you, that are kind of very clearly defined, very much a part of the definition of the network here. Um, and hyperparameters might be these things that um, kind of are are a bit set away from that. There are other aspects of the model choice. So for instance, how you choose to initialize these weights and biases, uh, what kind of uh, prior distribution you draw them from might be something you would call a hyperparameter. Uh, the depth and the width of the, net, of the network and other things, the choice of the nonlinearity, these are all hyperparameters that you could tune to then change kind of the nature of the minimization problem and the quality of the, of the final predictor that you learn when you, when you do this. Um, are there any questions about this? I have a question. Yes. Uh, and maybe this is jumping too far ahead, but uh, like at least in Bayesian sense, there are these non-parametric methods that, that folks talk about. Uh, are you restricted by the fact that you need parameters for the map that you're trying to uh, learn, so to speak? So that's a great question. I set this up to, to be focused, to focus mostly on the parametric approach because that's what people mostly do. Um, but you don't have to take a non uh, a parametric approach. You could just set it up in a non-parametric way. And actually, um, so just kind of the things, the elements you might deal with in that case are rather than actually refer to the parameters, you'll just refer to the function values on your training points and mm -hmm. you'll condition on that. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see that in actually just a couple of slides, but part of actually this this talk is that it builds a connection um, between uh, the parametric point of view and a non-parametric point of view. Um, this will come up in just a couple of slides when we talk about Gaussian processes, because that's, Excellent. for instance, a very traditional non-parametric method. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so just a couple slides before we actually get into uh, more of the details on um, where the field is now. So, and, and how is it different from what people were doing, say, decades ago in the 80s or 90s? So, one of the things that people have kind of understood better now is um, that by increasing the scale, they can perform well at tasks that uh, were previously impossible. So we're really now in the regime where we have lots amount, uh, large amounts of data. Where I put a quote on, you know, we need to talk about large relative to what, and and we can do that too. But I'll just say large amounts of data, really large models. Um, so millions of data points, uh, billions of parameters potentially, uh, lots of compute. Um, so there are certain aspects of, the, that, of this, the way I formulated it, that has to do with increasing scale and other aspects that 
I think don't have to do with increasing the scale where things are actually like qualitatively different. And this question of um, how much how, how much of the future gains can you predict just by scaling, you know, in the way that we are now versus uh, uh, more clever approaches? That's a question that people in the field are talking about and investigating. Um, I'll show you this. I'll just point to this plot over here, which is very recent. It's from um, uh, a very nice uh, language model developed by OpenAI called GPT-3. Um, where you can kind of in a user can kind of interact by asking this model language model questions and it'll give answers um, and you would sort of see here uh, now maybe ignore for a moment what the x axis actually is but um, the increase that you get in accuracy when you increase the model size although it's quite a bit of increase so even in just a few years we've gone from models that had 1.3 billion parameters to 175 billion parameters, uh, which was GPT-3. And you see that the accuracy is quite a bit better on certain kinds of problems. Some of this might have to do with scale and some of it is kind of, um, it might be a bit discontinuous as a function of scale. So you see that the behavior is a function of this, uh, this variable on the X axis actually uh, uh, has a bit of, um, has different behavior in this regime versus over here. Um, and uh, so deep, deep neural networks um, you know, can be applied pretty much everywhere you need to do some sort of function approximation. And especially when you don't know too much about the, you don't really have too much of a structured problem. So in, um, uh, in computer vision and language, uh, robotics, health and medicine, even in science, Although in science, I would say, particularly in physics, we have a lot more knowledge of the structure of the problem that we are often dealing with. So in those cases, it, it's possible that maybe uh, you don't need a big a hammer as, as um, a deep neural network, but certainly in these other domains, which for which we know much less about the structure of say, uh, an Im image distribution or the structure of language, um, these sorts of models uh, are doing quite well in these in these regimes. Um, so there are lots of uh, questions I would say for which which people have attempted to answer, but I think still we don't have we don't have a lot of clarity on them at the level of what you might want to write in say a machine learning textbook. So what sorts of conditions allow uh, network training and lead to good performance? That's ultimately the thing that's of greatest interest. Um, there's a huge design space, um, which is both good and bad. I mean, part of what uh, deep learning has enabled is, um, you know, a, a much richer class of models. Um, but then that also makes it uh, uh, very chaotic. Like, how, how should you pick your model? Um, are there better models out there? How can we get to them if we don't understand what current models, uh, how to structure current models? And then also this interplay between the choice of the task and the choice of the architecture and algorithm. Um, I don't think that's well understood. I will say though that uh, what I think makes part of um, studying these systems from a more scientific perspective uh, tricky, and this is maybe something that comes up in any sort of science of artificial systems, is that you're facing, uh, you know, unlike nature, which is maybe a somewhat pretty fixed target over the time scales we study them, here we're facing a design problem with specific goals. Um, you know, it's very, it's very much tied to our desires as humans, what constraints we put on these models. So we have certain expectations, for instance, we mo want models that perform well. We want models that maybe tell us about their uncertainty, that are maybe robust to shifts in this training distribution that I, I, meant, I talked about. Uh, we might impose uh, a need for privacy on models. So we want models that wouldn't reveal a lot of, you know, that maybe changes the nature of the way the model needs to learn. If it ends up memorizing some aspects of the training data, that's an issue. And fairness and all these other aspects that uh, are, are topics of mainstream study in computer science and in machine learning. And so I think as physicists, when you try to work on these problems, it's important to understand that uh, as opposed to digging very deep, I think the way we do in a way one would do in physics, where any knowledge we gain about a system, we can, you know, will will be could potentially be useful down the road. Um, since this is a design problem and it's all artificial anyway, we may not want to know all sorts of things about 
the systems. We just want to know enough so that we can kind of uh, proceed through this design space um, in an intelligent way. Um, and, and so in particular, which questions have answers that are widely applicable and are not too microscopic? Again, I think in physics, we tend to have a better sense of this due to because uh, physics has a much longer history and these things have been studied also. Um, and we people, I think, don't have a sense of what, uh, what sorts of questions, uh, how, how to even choose such questions so that you don't get behavior that's too microscopic, uh, but some kind of widely applicable phenomenon. So even in this talk, you'll see that uh, the motivation isn't just to understand everything about a system, it's to understand good performing models. So I'm going to try to hone in on where those models live. And then also uh, another focus is to try to simplify design. So if we can kind of partition the space of hyperparameters that we have access to into neater classes, we can, you know, then, then we're reducing the complexity of the design space and that's also um, good. But we're gonna approach both of these kind of in a, in a kind of scientific way uh, with some connections to physics. Um, any questions so far, by the way? Um, if not, uh, just maybe put one other slide about um, physics and machine learning uh, connections. So there's a nice article from a few years back now, uh, which I recommend uh, everyone to read. It's kind of interesting that sort of based on uh, a very um, a well received and well known talk that somebody gave at a machine learning conference uh, where the speaker had kind of posited the question, has machine learning just become alchemy? Um, you know, are we moving through this space sort of just by trial and error without much of an idea of where we're going? Or are, are we just revisiting things that we revisited before uh, historically? Um, and this, uh, this article has a nice quote that I think talks about why, why I think um, physicists or this, the style of doing, res doing research in the style of theoretical physics uh, or physics in general um, is, is useful in machine learning. Um, so physicists are amazing at devising simple experiments to root out explanations for phenomena. Um, and I think this, uh, so you could ask, you know, what does physics bring to machine learning? What do physicists bring to machine learning? Those may be two different questions. There are of course like old connections between physics and machine learning, uh, particularly on the statistical mechanics dimension. So of course, like spin glasses for optimization problems, um, probabilistic graphical models, which um, uh, were are, are very useful, have been very studied, kind of started from also from statistical mechanics. Um, but I think there's opportunity for some uh, newer connections. Um, if you particularly try to go to the edge of ML research and translate problems that are there into simpler pieces, uh, that then um, folks in physics or, or um, people with a physics background can study. Um, so that's maybe one side comment on the physics and machine learning uh, connections. Um, but going back to kind of the state of machine learning right now, um, from the kind of relatively short amount of time that I've spent in the field, I would say that, um, uh, that I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of, um, accepted or mainstream theoretical work in machine learning tends to focus on certification. So uh, people want bounds on performance, some sort of guarantee that if I, for instance, use this many samples on, on a model of this size, then I'm guaranteed to learn kind of the best predictor in that particular hypothesis class that I'm dealing with um, in a certain amount of time. Um, that's just one, one example. Um, and or, or for instance, I want my model not to reveal too much information about the data that it's been trained on, say user data. So guarantees on privacy, on again, robustness, fairness, all of these things. Um, I think, but I think like um, there's a different dimension which has to do with understanding that will also could potentially be useful to design down the road. Um, Cause, uh, and, and I think that the culture of trying to understand uh, what's going on in these in these sorts of systems uh, 
it, it tends to be less a part of the inherent culture of machine learning and the focus theoretically tends to be more on certification. I think there's room for both of these. Of course, certification is extremely important, um, but uh, on the understanding front, I think that's where, you know, we should at least try to learn from kind of the successes of current systems to be able to systematically design uh, better systems. So I would say very little of the theory that currently exists in machine learning, although I hope some of the examples in this talk are kind of are, are counter examples to that, very little of the theory is currently predictive. Um, you know, I, I think most of the time at best, like after the fact, you can kind of give some sort of loose explanation for why something happened. But if we can try to get things to the point where we can actually make new predictions that actually hold up in practice, that would be, uh, I think, really, a, really a success. Um, I think I have. Yeah, this the talk was by Ali Rahimi, uh, and thank you for the link. Um, so, uh, so as one example of that, to segue now into the actual content, um, here's something that came from, uh, I'm gonna, there were a bunch of empirical observations that kind of led people to focus more and more on over studying over-parameterized networks, and in particular, uh, when the over-parameterization comes from increasing the width of hidden layers. So here's uh, just an example, kind of um, a numerical experiment where, uh, you take a neural network, it's just two layers uh, deep, you increase the number of hidden nodes or hidden units in each of the layers, and you see that at some point, uh, well, the, train, the training error or the, the training uh, you know, loss is, uh, is set to zero, is perfectly minimized uh, once you have enough parameters. Um, so basically, when you have enough parameters in these models, you can pretty much fit anything um, enough parameters relative to the number of training points, you can pretty much fit anything. And that's what you see here uh, at this point where it hits zero. But the other thing that you notice is how the test error continues to go down as you make it wider and wider. Um, and that actually runs counter to what people, the, what existing theory or the existing belief in machine learning was, which was that um, the number of parameters uh, kind of in a model is roughly a measure of complexity. Um, you don't want models that are too complex, unnecessarily complex for the problem you're trying to tackle. And so actually making a model over parameterized is bad. Um, this has relationships to VC dimension. So VC dimension um, kind of measures complexity uh, in a way that's related to the number of parameters. Um, and this, this kind of observation runs counter to those um, kind of older beliefs uh, or what older theory would have predicted. Um, maybe it's not su as surprising to physicists because um, you might say, well, even if I increase the number of parameters in the model, if it's not, if those parameters are not actually being updated or if they're not receiving actual information about the training data, then what's the problem? If they, if they stay kind of uh, essentially random, uh, then maybe they're not, uh, they're not actually a nuisance. And there's a sense in which that um, sort of idea is, turns out actually to be true. But this is what people in machine learning uh, had been referring to kind of as the mystery of generalization in over-parameterized networks. Why is it that such large models uh, can do well and that they continue to do better as you make them bigger? Okay, so um, now I'll actually delve into content. And this this is the part of the talk where I just kind of want to review uh, or, or uh, uh, give you some highlights of what has been understood from studying networks that are infinitely wide. So just working in that limit. Um, uh, so um, one of the things that was uh, very fruitful to do is that when you take this infinite width limit, um, where each of the hidden nodes again in each layer uh, is made to be infinitely large, um, it's fruitful to think about uh, the function space kind of approach and not so much focus on the parameters because now you're going to deal with infinitely many parameters, but really you want to study kind of this collective uh, the thing. Um, you know, there, there are infinitely many random variables, but the thing that you're interested in at the end of the day is some collective thing, which is uh, the actual function. And it's the function that's going to uh, make predictions. You know, who cares what the actual parameters are, are set to? Um, so uh, it turns out that if you um, take this infinite width limit, uh, for most choices of, uh, 
if you, if you look at networks at initialization and, and ask uh, what is the distribution I get over functions uh, when I take this infinite width limit, you'll essentially get, you'll, you'll get a Gaussian process or a Gaussian field theory. So what do I mean by that? So um, let's go back to thinking about when we're trying to solve empirical risk minimization or Bayesian inference, how do we start? We start with some prior over parameters, um, some, some belief we have about a good distribution from which to draw the parameters. Um, or if we're actually running an optimization algorithm, we'll just choose an initialization, say for gradient descent and then run, run the algorithm. Um, and so typically what, what people do in practice is at initialization, they'll draw the parameters uh, IID randomly, for instance, they, they might draw them from a normal distribution. So here, the, this initial distribution over the weights is just normal. Um, I'm going to take these to have always mean zero, but there's some uh, variance in here. Um, and also uh, kind of some, some distribution, in this case, normal also for the biases. Um, and so if you think of this as the computation that's being done, you know, from the from the very first, uh, you know, pre-activation to all the way in further layers, what you're doing is uh, summing up over, you know, multiplying in the output of the uh, previous layer and then uh, into some weight matrix, which is random, and you have in general infinitely many um, such contributions. So this this first uh, layer is a bit of a is just a special case. Uh, because it's not going to uh, be taken to be infinite. Um, this D is finite. But in all the layers that come after that, you're summing, if you condition on the input that comes into that layer, and you think about the Ws and the Bs as random variables, then the randomness in F uh, kind of comes from that randomness in W and B, and you have a sum over infinitely many random variables. So you can apply the central limit theorem. Um, and that's kind of at a high level, the, the sort of result uh, uh, that you get as n goes to infinity, you can apply CLT to every layer. And what that will mean is that any co collection of uh, function outputs on any finite collection of points, x1 through xm, let's say those are, again, your training points, will be Gaussian distributed. This is the definition of a Gaussian process, or uh, another, another way to say it is just that it's a uh, Gaussian field theory with a particular um, kind of mean and mean and covariance function or two point function. Um, so I'll write that schematically like this. Um, at initialization, these Fs are drawn from some Gaussian process. In this case, the mean of that Gaussian process is zero. It has some two point function or covariance function, which you can calculate. Again, here, this expectation is over the weights and biases. That's where the randomness is coming from. Um, and uh, to calculate the covariance function for uh, a certain layer L, you can write down a recursion relationship uh, in terms of what's coming into it from the previous layer, just because, of course, the computation that you're doing here is recursive. Uh, it relates F to the L to F to the L minus one. And similarly, you can relate K to the L to the properties of what's coming in from the previous layer. And because the previous layer is also a Gaussian process with a known covariance function, you can, um, you know, uh, calculate this, uh, you can write it in this form, you're going to calculate uh, the, this, um, this expectation value where the F's themselves are drawn from the previous Gaussian process. And um, you can, this, this formula is actually very simple. It's just actually a two dimensional integral, um, because you're focusing on two points x and x prime. And here you will focus again on these two points x and x prime. And this integration over the over the randomness uh, will just be a two-dimensional integration. Um, and so uh, what you get essentially in this infinite width limit, again, just focusing on initialization, so completely random IID parameters, is, a, is the following mapping. You get kind of a recursion on the functions that's um, induced, of course, by the structure of the network. So uh, you have F sub 0, you have F sub 1, and all the way down, uh, you know, you get f, f to the L. Um, now you take the infinite, you know, infinite width limit and you get essentially your recursion relationships on kernels or on the covariance functions or, or equivalently the, the two point functions. So um, you start with some uh, 
uh, base case covariance function k0, which just amounts to taking an inner product between x and x prime. Um, and then there's some mapping c, which you can write down um, actually analytically in, in certain cases pretty easily, um, that maps you from k0 to k1 all the way down. And in the infinite width limit, this is the only information about the network that you actually need because all the other kind of, because it's Gaussian, everything else kind of uh, is tied to that. Um, and so you have a complete description of the prior over functions at initialization. And that's pretty powerful. Um, one of the reasons it's powerful is it essentially makes doing Bayesian inference uh, pretty trivial. I'll, I won't spend much time on this, on this slide, but uh, essentially once you kind of think about the function space point of view, think about the fact that you have now a Gaussian process prior, um, that integration that I referred to earlier uh, when doing Bayesian inference, which would have been an integration over d theta, you can actually replace with just doing an integration over the function values um, of the on the uh, training data points, uh, which is this vector big F that I've used here uh, as a substitute. Um, and you have this prior, and you also uh, need kind of um, a choice in the in the likelihood. So there, you're going to use square. If you use square loss. Uh, if you were to write this down, you would see that uh, the integrand would be completely Gaussian and you can do this integral exactly. Um, and so that's really nice. You basically skipped any of the hardship having to do that high dimensional integration over theta because you got it for free by making everything Gaussian, uh, and which is exact kind of in this infinite width limit. And so that's really nice. You get these um, closed form expressions for the uh, distribution over um, for new predictions, f star given new points, x star. Um, and uh, this is something that we kind of studied, we implemented, we, we looked at how well it performs um, and so on. And there's a lot more that you can um, uh, find in, in some of these papers. And, um, and so this is, this is nice. This gives you a completely different non-parametric way to map a neural network in the infinite width limit to some other object. And then you can kind of compare the behavior of a real finite width neural network to this uh, kind of infinite width object. Um, yes, Aman, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Uh, get, is, is getting K bar difficult? You know, the kernel that represents the... N no, not the exp the expression for it is, is uh, trivial. It's like, um, I mean, do you mean the expression for it or calculating it in practice? calculating it in practice yeah. so the the difficulty uh with in general um gaussian process methods is that uh you just have to keep track of uh you have to keep track of the entire training set when you do these things so actually it doesn't the, there isn't much more difficulty the difficulty of k bar and mu bar is the same i would say uh, and it's really mu bar that you care about um mm -hmm. But you have to form this giant matrix, um, uh, the K matrix uh, evaluated on all of the training points, so all possible pairs. So that's like an M by M matrix if you had the M training points. So it's just that the computational cost of that, um, it tends to scale badly. You have to invert that matrix and that's where most of the uh, cost comes from. Uh, and this is a well-known kind of uh, obstacle I would say for it's not really an obstacle because people actually are uh, have really pushed the boundary of what's possible. So um, even in the past few years, like we've been scaling up some of these methods to be able to calculate these things for large training data sets. So I would say the only um, the only setback for actually implementing this is to get around this computational cost that scales, uh, you know, as as naively as like um, m to the cubed, I think, for m training data points. But there are all sorts of approximations you can make to the kernel, um, sparsify, and so on to make that to reduce the complexity of that problem if you actually want to implement it. I see. Thank you. Can I ask one quick question? Yes. So when you let the width go to infinity, it seems that you are letting width go to infinity in a sequential manner, like the lower layer and the sequential the next layer and so forth. So that I'm wondering the same will be true when the n goes to infinity simultaneously for all layers. 
That's a great question. And uh, the answer is yes, it turns out to be true. So in, in our paper originally, we, uh, we took a, we weren't math, we're not mathematicians, so we didn't actually prove that it's a Gaussian process. We took the sequential limit. Um, and this is, uh, but there's a paper that actually appeared simultaneously with ours. Um, so this third reference here does the simultaneous limit and proves it um, exactly. There are other differences uh, between the two papers, but uh, it has now been proven both in that fully connected case and for many other architectures that you can take the sequence, but that you can take the simultaneous limit and get the same result. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I so far the the discussion was focused on infinitely wide networks in function space um, at initialization, and then also when you do Bayesian inference, because that turned out to be trivial also. Um, now you can going back to this empirical risk minimization aspect that that is maybe the thing we're more interested in um, you could ask what if we took that infinitely wide network and did gradient descent training instead and not Bayesian inference is there anything about that problem that we can say exactly and it turns out that uh, you can and it was solved um, in a very beautiful manner but let me set up kind of the elements of this because this will be important for part two um, so the idea is um, let's again take this shift do this switch from thinking about parameters to thinking about functions but let's do that when we're thinking about gradient descent so actual um you know we're not doing the high dimensional integrals uh over d theta or over um the function we're now uh, uh looking at the evolution of this differential equation so um to remind you what what the setup is here we have some parameters of the model um these are the weights and biases in the neural network, but let me just write them collectively as theta sub mu. Now let, let me just deal with this scalar function f sub x, uh, this loss or the cost L, and again, these training inputs x sub alpha. So um, we have some evolution. I've written this in continuous time, uh, but you could equivalently do it in uh, discrete time, um, just with discrete updates. Um, and uh, we have this differential equation for the evolution of the parameters, which is what we use to update the parameters uh, when we run gradient descent as an algorithm. So d theta, you know, theta dot equals uh, minus eta times the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters. That's gradient descent. Um, here, the eta is not very meaningful. Eta is the learning rate. Um, it is meaningful for the for the discrete updates, but let me just keep it in there. Um, uh, just just so you remember that there's a learning rate. Um, and uh, rather than, you know, let's break up these uh, these derivatives just into um, derivatives that have to do with uh, kind of the network itself, the, the, the mapping um, between parameters and the function changing, and then things that have to do with changes in the loss. So uh, let me say that a, a better way. So the reason that, um, you know, the loss changes is because, of course, the parameters change, but you could view that kind of through this intermediate thing, which is that the function values themselves are changing. Because the loss depends directly on um, the values of f. For instance, if you have squared loss, you have f minus y squared, um, something of that form. So the loss depends directly on the function values. Again, that's the only thing you observe. And then there's some change in the function coming from the parameters. So just uh, with that trivial rewrite, then if you look at kind of how the function changes at any arbitrary point x that you want to make a, for which you want to make a prediction, um, you again just use chain rule. So the function changes because the parameters change, and then the parameters themselves change because they're being updated with gradient descent. Um, and plugging in this line above into this, uh, you have all these things that are now uh, have derivatives with respect to f or kind of use f as an intermediate between the relationship between the loss and the parameters. And I boxed really the equation to think about is this boxed one here, which tells you that the function evolves uh, in a way that's governed by this derivative, the, the derivative of the loss with respect to those actual function values on these training points. So again, this would be for squared loss. This would just be f of x sub alpha minus y sub alpha. So something that's linear in f. And then there's this other quantity. 
where which is the thing in parentheses i've just grouped it all into one one thing um and uh this equation turns out to be a powerful way to think about the problem in the infinite width limit because it simplifies now in its most general form like the way i've written it here it isn't necessarily very useful because um the this differential equation by itself is not closed so we have f of x the thing that we're trying to study uh this for instance depends on f which is fine which is great but uh theta here is, is is now a new dynamical variable that is related to gradients of f. It's not just f. Um, and that new dynamical variable has its own differential equation that you would need to write down. And if you were to do that, you would find that actually that equation depends on new dynamical variables that have to do with higher order derivatives of f with respect to theta. And so you kind of get this mess uh, naively if, if you make no other uh, simplest, if you if you make no assumptions of higher and higher derivatives of f appearing certain um, certain combinations of them appearing as dynamical variables in the problem and you have you don't have a way of closing the equation so just choosing a subset of them that you could actually solve to get um, an answer to how f evolves but um, it turns out that in the infinite width limit this drastically simplifies um, so just to just to write down again what this special dynamical variable is. I'm going to refer to it from now on uh, as the neural tangent kernel. Um, so this object is itself a kernel similar to, you know, or a covariance function similar to the one that I mentioned earlier. Um, but this one has to do is is derived from gradients of f rather than from f itself. Um, and you can see that. Um, so here in the definition, just to uh, have everyone on the same page, uh, you take a gradient of f with respect to the parameters theta, um, evaluate it at x, and then contract that with a gradient um, at some other point x prime. And the contraction is over all the parameters in the network. So this is that some dynamical variable, but amazingly, and I won't go into this because that would be a talk within itself, amazingly, as the width goes to infinity, this dynamical variable doesn't evolve at all. And so if it doesn't evolve um, here, uh, all the other, you know, you basically close the equations. All the other equations, all the, all the other variables of the problem have dropped out. Um, so it's just frozen at its initial value. Let me call that theta naught. Um, and then you again have a linear, if you use squared loss here, you again have a linear equation that you can solve exactly um, to get, uh, to get a um, closed form expression for f of x. So that's pretty amazing, uh, I think. Uh, it was a pretty cool result. Uh, first came up in this paper by Jaco et al. Um, and then in many other papers that appeared afterwards that um, kind of proved it more rigorously or with different conditions, etc. And so what this says, uh, another way of saying it is that if you have an infinitely wide neural network and you evolve it with gradient descent, subject to certain conditions, which is this asterisk here, which I'm going to come back to in part two, of the talk. Uh, but basically, pretty, as long as your learning rate is less than a certain value, it will turn out to be the case that this quantity, this, this kernel does not evolve. And what you do, what you're essentially doing is doing kernel regression in that limit. Um, if that doesn't mean much to you, I, I'll just say, I, I say that in case um, people with more of a machine learning background um, uh, have familiarity with it, but basically it means, you know, you can think of deep neural networks as learning uh, a kernel. Uh, they're learning some map, this, this theta here, which is some kind of similarity map between two pairs of inputs. That's the thing that a neural network in, in general is learning. And in kernel regression, what you do is you kind of fix that choice, uh, a, a choice for the similarity map and really just train um, there's another way of saying it, which is that you kind of fix fix the map that you fix. A, it could be a very rich map, but you just fix it, uh, you know, add initialization using random parameters, uh, and then um, maybe form a linear model on top of that. That's what kernel regression essentially is. Um, and so there's now what this has shown is basically an equivalence between 
this thing called deep, you know, this thing that we do, which is deep neural networks with gradient descent and these other existing methods within machine learning, uh, an existing method, which is kernel regression. But the twist is that the kernel is new here and both in the, in the previous example that I mentioned, these kernels are being derived from the neural networks themselves. So they have the structure of that network. And if you have a very you know, new architecture, especially some of the ones that are state of the art, then you're getting a kernel that um, you know, people hadn't studied before uh, in, in much depth uh, in the older literature. So the twist here is that it's, it's an equivalence between this new thing and, and an old thing, but the old thing uses a kernel that is new in structure. As a month, sorry to interrupt you, but we have maybe two, three minutes left. Okay, um, so I will uh, just actually finish up part one and then I'll, I'll skip to, um, I won't get to talking about part two, which, uh, which is unfortunate, but maybe I'll just give some of the highlights of what happens uh, there. Um, so uh, to, to maybe close this section, it turns out that another way of thinking about um, this infinite width limit um, in terms of parameters is that if you made a first order Taylor expansion of the network, with respect to parameters, and you only train this model. So, you know, I'm dropping here now the higher order terms that have to do with uh, derivatives of the map F0. Um, if you just train this model, then it would be equivalent to, um, uh, uh, to all of everything I said before. So another way of stating it is an infinitely wide deep network, um, deep neural network trained with gradient descent is is the same as just training its first order Taylor expansion. That's all you're doing. And, in, and the most general setting of training would be if you trained you know, the Taylor expansion to all orders, um, but that's not what you're doing in infinite width limit. Um, and uh, this is something that we, you know, just making a comparison between networks um, um, and their first order Taylor expansions you can see that my, uh, some of these plots show basically that you can get pretty good agreement between a network that is sufficiently wide um, and the training of its first order Taylor expansion. And, and this is of course, like this becomes exact as you make the network uh, wider and wider. Um, okay, here's a partial list of references for this section. Um, I, I highlighted in blue um, some of the starting points for reading chronologically about this. Uh, in red, I wanted to highlight um, some of the papers that appeared uh, uh, more recently that have now tried to do perturbation theory um, about the infinite width limit. And actually I'm missing even one that is more recent, um, I think by uh, Jim Halverson and company. So I apologize for that. Uh, so this is not a complete list of papers, but um, suffice it to say that the infinite width limit has been kind of is now uh, well understood and um, people have also uh, implemented kind of or worked out perturbative corrections at uh, finite width. Um, and uh, you can then kind of ask the question, does that describe uh, neural networks uh, in practice? Well, does that describe the dynamics of, of neural networks at the typical operating point that they have in, in practice? So part two, unfortunately, I won't get to, but I will just maybe, maybe I'll look at, I'll uh, point out this slide, which is that, um, you know, what did we gain? We, we had width, which was a hyperparameter in this problem. Um, it turns out another important consideration is what the choice of the learning rate is in gradient descent. So basically this infinite width result that I mentioned, the neural tangent kernel holds if the learning rate is sufficiently small. Because you can think about it, uh, another way of thinking about it is that as you make the network wider, you know, you imagine doing a first order Taylor expansion of the function about its initialization. So you just have kind of this convex problem, uh, if you use, for instance, squared loss about the, about the initial point. And this uh, becomes exact as, as you make the network wider and wider. But in order to stay in this basin, that you've kind of, of approximation, the learning rate has to be small relative to the curvature of that basin. If the learning rate were to be too large, especially when, when you're at finite width, 
um, then the higher order finite width corrections, you know, there are non non zero finite width corrections, they're going to kick in. And because your learning rate is too large for that initial basin, you're going to leave that basin. And that's essentially what uh, our, our paper kind of worked out and showed with a combination of theory and experiment that this actually happens. And this is something that appears to be non perturbative. So you know, you can imagine making better and better Taylor approximations to this initial basin. But what happens when you choose the learning rate to be uh, too large, and we say what that means, then you're kicked out of the basin and you go to some other part of the optimization landscape with a different learned function than what you had kind of close to your starting point. And just to kind of show, maybe this is the one, one plot that I want to show, which shows the way in which this transition is becoming sharp. So this is the x axis is a is learning rate. The y axis is this change in this kernel function that I mentioned, the NTK kernel, which you can kind of think of as an order parameter for the problem. So what we're guaranteed is that if eta is small enough, uh, here less than the blue line, then as width goes to infinity, the change in that kernel, the change in that order parameter vanishes between infinite time and initial and the initial time. And you see that here in, in the sweep from black to red, as the width is becoming wider, this uh, the change in this, um, I guess the order parameter itself could be the difference, but uh, this change is going to zero. And you see that the change is staying finite at learning rates that are larger than this. And this is becoming sharper with width. And so this is the phase transition that we kind of studied in this problem. Um, I'll put this there are, um, this is maybe another um, slide that kind of shows what um, so um, uh, another way of viewing this is as I said if you think of learning rate as one axis here when the learning rate is too large uh, your optimization, you know, procedure just diverges completely. Um, when the learning rate is small enough, in what I've labeled lazy over here, then you recover as width goes to infinity the existing dynamics that I talked about. And then there's this new regime here, which um, which we kind of uh, found and, and investigated in our paper, which we termed the catapult phase, which doesn't connect to that existing infinite width theory. Um, to really recover it, you end up needing to do take kind of like a dual limit of both width going to infinity and the time uh, that's relevant for training to go to infinity together. And if you scale that in the right way, then you can kind of recover um, in, in infinite width and infinite time this sort of phase. Um, so we have uh, a simple model, which amazingly, you know, I, I mentioned that that analysis of the differential equation describing F uh, has the problem that it's not closed in general. And in this infinite width limit, the NTK, I said that amazingly it turned out to be closed there because the NTK didn't involve. Um, in general, if you wanna study those finite width corrections or non-perturbative corrections, uh, you again will not get a closed equation, but we we found um, kind of a very simple model where again, amazingly you can you can close the equations and just have, have a two, two, um, uh, a two variable kind of dynamical system, F and lambda. Lambda here is essentially a measure of the curvature, the local curvature of the model. Um, and analyzing these, you kind of can recover that you can, you can um, show that there's a phase transition in the sense that, in the sense of dynamical systems, meaning when the learning rate is small enough, you flow, at, at large times, you flow to some fixed point in this F lambda space. And when eta is uh, larger, large enough, you flow to some completely different kind of uh, set of fixed points. Uh, and there's a sharp transition between these two. Um, so unfortunately, I, I won't get have time to cover any of these. There's also um, critical exponents, for instance, that you can look at. Um, and this, the reason this phase is even interesting or was of interest to us is because we think that it's these regimes where, where your model changes quite a bit, where you're actually doing the learning, you know, the learning part of deep learning, uh, that, um, that is where maybe is maybe the operating point of most models. And 
uh, leads to better performance. And there's a relationship between the performance there and the value of the curvature. So in general, the lower the curvature, the flatter the minimum you found, you tend to generalize better. Um, although that there are nuances there um, that I won't get into. So um, I will close there and uh, basically refer you to the uh, preprint for part two, but um, feel free to, of course, um, contact me if you have any questions uh, or would like to hear more. And uh, in closing, I'd like to thank all my collaborators at Google, a really wonderful group of people with whom I've done this work. The first portion was based off of uh, 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 co-authored projects um, with the following people. And the second portion on large learning rates uh, was with um, the folks listed below. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, are there any questions? So we are over time. However, since we're online, perhaps nobody will shut, you know, nobody will make noise leaving. So if you would like to hang out and ask a question, I think it's perfectly fine. So yeah, let me know if you have questions. Raise your hand or speak up. There's a question in the chat, which is why isn't the bias divided by n? That's a great question. Uh, this has to do with, uh, you know, dividing by n is not is a natural constraint for the weights because you want to get each signal coming into the next uh, hidden node to be order one. And so uh, a bias, you know, the um, when you look at what the signal is going into a particular hidden node in the next layer, it gets a sum over infinitely many contributions from the Ws, but it gets only a single contribution from the bias. So to scale down the contribution from the Ws, you need to scale down their strength, so you divide by n. But the bias, you're just putting in a single one per hidden node, so you don't need to descale it to get something that's kind of natural. Jaden? Uh, yeah. Uh... Thank you, Yasman, for the great talk. Uh, I have a very, very naive question. Um, so, in your in your differential equation for um, for this empirical risk minimization, where you talk about like uh, like the learning rate for the for the function, uh, there was this theta the theta uh, quantity, uh, and then it had some definition. Uh, yeah, I mean, the slide would be nice. Like this big. Oh, yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. Yes, uh, the big theta. Uh, I mean, isn't this, I mean, this is, I, I've, I've just, I'm very familiar with this, um, this Fisher information approach. And this is essentially like, so what I'm thinking of this is like some kind of constrained, uh, uh, no, not constrained, what's the right word? Like rescaled gradient descent, where it's like rescaled by like the metric. Like in this case, the, the metric being, well, this, you know, uh, this, this Fisher information, this theta parameter that you're using. And in the references, so so A, is that intuition correct? And B, uh, in your reference list, I, I thought that this was not something that was highlighted uh, or like has have people like looked into it because it's so obvious. Um, that the, the metric part or the Fisher information part or both? That's a, a great, Question. I would also, my reference list is uh, very incomplete. It's just a starting point for, for folks trying to get a handle on it. Um, I would say that, uh, yes, it is related to the Fisher information. Um, uh, I, I think the Fisher has maybe some other, uh, sometimes it is defined a certain, maybe has subtle differences in the definition, like whether it's um, and I, I forget these, uh, unfortunately, but it's like, there's an empirical version, there's like a population version, there's, um, but it's, it's essentially the same thing, uh, like whether it's a, a contraction over, um, it's a derivative with respect to the parameters, um, and then, and then a contraction there. I don't think, um, so there's a relationship there, but in a lot of these papers, uh, they haven't used the language of the Fisher. I think more recently I've seen like one or two. Um, to, to talk about it and then connect it maybe to any other older papers that might have studied the Fisher. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what's new here, what I can more confidently say is definitely new here is the fact that this thing doesn't evolve in the infinite width limit. So kind of that's a combination of, um, you know, that, that is very much tied actually to this initialization, actually the, the scaling of the weights with N 
for mm -hmm. variance with n that gives rise to this. So I would say like this this part of the phenomenon, which could be recast as maybe a statement about the fissure, I think, uh, mm -hmm. is new. Um, but like whether you know, there are probably older papers that take this. Uh, where was this that I? This change in 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 this uh, change of variables and chain rule that I did here. Uh, this I don't have a site. I just kind of wrote it myself. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this sort of thing I imagine has appeared elsewhere. Um, the thinking of it. Uh, does that help? Or maybe I. Oh yeah, yeah. I was just the the. I mean, uh, the the reason why I even like even belabor this point is. If this were the case in the infinite limit, so I'm thinking like if the manifold was like, you know, you're not focusing on a local aspect of the manifold. In fact, you're looking at like a, like a huge patch. And then uh, like, a, like, I mean, we missed part two of your talk, but then my next question would be like, is this something that can, that can like even have implications for the finite width? Because in that case, you're, you're suddenly not, you're, you're in a, you're in a limit where you're only, learning uh, like a part of the manifold in, in my mind. And this is just intuition. I, I, I don't know if this is, uh, if this bears out in practice. Um, uh, I kind of followed your question. So um, when you say partly learns the manifold, you're talking about... Um... Well, b because you said the, the Taylor expansion. So, I mean, especially because of the Taylor expansion. So the fact that you can even survive just the first order being like a good approximation tells me that it's not super, I mean, it's not very curved. It's like, you know, it's on some part of the manifold, which, which is fairly linear, right? Yeah. Uh, right. But you get to control that with N and with eta. So, you know, if you give me an arbitrary neural network, what that curvature is will vary. What it's saying is as you what I guess this result is saying, I, I, to rephrase, I think what you said is that as the width goes to infinity, yes, you basically just have a like local, you, you have a, you know, linear approximation and a convex problem, even mm -hmm. though globally, you, you know, the problem is different, but locally because of, of what you have access to by virtue of your initialization mm -hmm. and your choice of learning rate, you effectively only explore that portion. But, and that portion may not be bad. It could be good performing. It depends on um, how rich, how good is this choice of theta? That's maybe another takeaway. But I think. you're right that, uh, yeah, this is an exact kind of statement um, uh, in, in, in these limits. Right, right. I, I, I'll shut up and I'll, I'll uh, leave the floor for more smart questions. Okay. But, but no, that was a great question. I should say, but if the learning rate is small enough. So if the learning okay. rate is too large, then as, even as you go, as you take width larger and larger, but you set learning rate to be above some critical threshold, this will not be true. And this is the thing that was, we studied in part two. I see, looking forward to reading your preprint. Thank you. There's a question in chat. Um, um, uh, which? Uh, it's no. um, the, very, the very last message. It's about how long does it take I guess to do the kernel regression on MNIST OCFR. Oh, that's a good question, and I that was it's been a while. Um, I want to say like I I should give you accurate numbers on that because it depends. Um, on hi. So that, uh huh. That was my question. So what I was actually getting at is that if I want to do similar training on like higher dimensional data. Like, so MNIST is, I guess, 28 times 28. But if I have to do it in physics, like the dimension would be of the range of like Avogadro's constant, like 10 to the power 23. So do you have like any tips as to like how to translate this into like higher dimensions, like way higher dimensions? Or do you think like it wouldn't really matter in, in this form formalism? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. And that's a different question than the one that I was thinking of, which is, I think, uh, so one complex, one computational bottleneck is just the scaling with the data set size, uh, like the number of training samples. Um, if you have, say, a fully connect, and this was also in the case of a fully connected network where um, 
you uh, you don't have to compute like per pixel covariances. You can just um, kind of vectorize, send things in, and just compute inner products between all pairs of training points, and then inverting that m by m matrix, or m is the size, the actual number of training examples, is costly. I think what you're referring to is a different cost, which is coming from the scaling with the input dimensionality, potentially just because you have to compute the kernel to begin with. Uh, so if I made, uh, if I had very high resolution images, for instance, um, as you as you say, and I don't remember, unfortunately, off the top of my head, how that how it scales with with that. Um, so they were all feasible, you know. There for MNIST CFAR ten, I would. I want to say kind of order of a day to do that computation. It's I don't think it's uh, too costly for something like um, uh, CIFAR 10 with a convolutional neural network. So I didn't talk about different architectures in this talk, but uh, these tend to scale poorly now because you need to keep track of not just sample to sample covariances, but pixel to pixel and sample to sample covariances. Those those take longer. So, but I would say all within kind of order days ish, uh, roughly. Um, but I, but I don't have a sense off the top of my head for how it scales with the input dimensionality, which I apologize for. No, thank you. Okay, other questions. I actually have a question. Um, if I take the kernel and time take time derivative of it, right on the right hand side, I'll get something uh, with three, I guess, yeah. um, or maybe with four. I'm not sure on top of my head. Uh, you know, like a kernel, but with four arguments rather than two, maybe three. I can do this again, and then I get probably a six or something like this, and then I keep going. So. It was maybe crazy, but in physics, uh, we have a system of infinite equations that's called BBGKY hierarchy. So that's that looks similar, but I don't know if if uh, if it's superficial or if it's. Uh... No, I think it's similar. I think it's similar, and I haven't um, made that connect. I haven't investigated that myself. I think that would be cool, and one of the things that I would be nice to do, but. Um, but I don't, but no, I, to my knowledge, nobody's done that. I think that's a great observation. Um, I was going to point out these two papers, um, 13 and 14, kind of essentially, mm -hmm. particularly 13, uh, kind of discuss what you said, the appearance of the higher, both higher derivatives in with respect to uh, the, the um, parameters, but also this emergence of more and more data points. Yeah. And I think it could be, maybe there's something to be gained from casting it in that language. It is very similar, I think. So, it's like those, those, like those things will scale. particle function for particle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and those things will scale, uh, you know, with one over N, but they will have higher and higher powers of one over N. The time derivatives of, of two point function, three point function, four point function. Yeah. Is, is that the point? Yeah, that, yeah, that is the point. And that's sort of, so that's the control for that expansion. And, mm -hmm. and these two papers do that nicely. I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's, that was a great question. Okay, last chance to ask a question. No more questions. There was one oh. in the chat, oh, but they- There's one more in the chat. Convolutions. Uh, that is a good question. I think there are some. I know that. Um, so the question is, can we employ any known symmetries to make the kernel calculations easier? Yeah, this is an area also I haven't worked on significantly to speed up kernel calculations. But um, I, it, even in the, um, Depending on the architecture, sometimes you have a simplification. So like convolutional networks, some of the ones that we did, sometimes they have, you know, all pixel covariances, or they just might have like diagonal pixel covariances, depending on, and, and that's, a, that's due to the symmetry of the problem that that turns out to be the case. Um, 
I know that I think when you want to calculate these kernels on augmented data, um, then you can also use tricks from symmetries, depending on what the data augmentation is to speed up uh, the kernel calculation. But that that's great. Uh, that's also a good question. And I don't, to my knowledge, not a lot has been done there. Um, Okay, there are no more questions. Then it's probably the time to finish this. Thank you for giving a great talk. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm sure somebody will write to you mail with questions. Could even be me. Okay, I guess no. I, I will. I will upload you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks a lot.